So hello everybody, it's lovely to have you joining us uh, here today, online again. I'm just going to give it um, a few minutes just to make sure that we can get everybody in the room. As you know, I like my numbers and uh, like to see how many people we can have and we've definitely been hitting the high hundreds, so uh, just want to make sure that we give enough time for people to enter. Hopefully you're all doing okay today. And I know that we have some people from all over the world, so I will uh, endeavour to be a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of the day you're joining us. And I suppose I'm also um, uh, uh, pleased to some respect that we've got external help from Supreme Stage helping us uh, with the uh, platform this year. So part of me is also just waiting maybe for a little voice in my ear to say when everybody's um, you know, in the room, as it were, and then we're good to go. There are a few stragglers coming in at the back, going to draw you down to the front of the hall, just so that you can be in that front row, ready to hear the exciting updates and uh, information that we have to share with you throughout today and the rest of the conference. So excellent. So in which case, um, I give everybody a very warm welcome and I will hand over to our IASA chair, Thomas Kaufholz, to officially start with his opening presentation. Over to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much, my friend. It's almost the same um, as when we have face to face conferences that we start a little late on the first day so that we um, have everybody in and my dear colleagues, my um, dear fr uh, guests and dear friends, I hope you um, had a good start into the day. And for me, it is a real drama that we again have to use a virtual room for our main annual conference and cannot meet face to face. In my opinion, which is a format to meet each other, to learn from each other and to respect other approaches to, to our overall goal in our cultural diverse EASA community. If you want to see something positive in the situation, you may argue this is better than nothing. And this is correct. Since our virtual conference in Leipzig 2020, quite a few things happened in the association. And I have to admit that not all of them were pleasant. Besides that one British zoo could not reopen after the lockdown due to the pandemic, Colleagues from the EASA Council had to resign due to different reasons. Colleagues which were of outstanding merits for our community, as there is Alet Zagob from Lisbon Zoo representing Portugal in Council and was chair of the EASA Education Committee. Mark Pilgrim, Chester Zoo re representing UK on the Council not only chair of the EASA EP committee, but also vice chair of our association. And last but not least, Simon Tang, our immediate past chair, also representing the United Kingdom in council. All good people and not only colleagues, but friends. Furthermore, I feel it is my duty to remember you on colleagues who passed away during the last year. Much too young, our colleague Tobias Rade curator of Berlin Zoo, who died in a traffic accident. And as you may remember, we celebrated last year 35 years EEP, which are five years older than our association. So we had 30 years EASA last year. And as an association like EASA is getting older, in other means, it is proved that the association is successful. Colleagues, which helped to get EASA running and kept running, do not only retire, but will also pass away. We will keep thankful remembrance to Bohumil Kral, former director of Prague Zoo, Josef Skotnitsky, former director of Krakow Zoo, Vladimir Spitzin, 
former director of Moscow Zoo, and Jeremy Melanson, former director of Jersey Zoo. These colleagues are standing for the beginning of EASA. There are just a few examples for all of the colleagues which did build the platform EASA without their efforts, there would be no conference and we would not meet today and this week. I will not hide that we in the leading bodies of EASA as the executive committee, the council, and in the ex uh, executive office, we had to deal at the moment with a more than unpleasant membership issue, which I would have never imagined that this, this could happen in, in and to our community. I hope that court cases, legal issues, insults and personal accusations will not be a common occurrence in the future of our association. This all means, please do not take it for granted that EASA is functioning, but that EASA needs your input and your personal engagement. Keep the community together. Respect your colleague who may have to work in other framework to which you are yourself is used. Stay strong with your principles, but do not implement an over bureaucracy. And to always remember, first of all, EASA is a zoo association. The regionally accepted zoos are the platform for all our goals, our mission, our vision, and our strategy. Without the acceptance of our visitors, the economic base of our zoos is in jeopardy and without successful zoos, meaning zoos that fulfill, that, uh, fulfill their homework in proper exhibits and in professional husbandry, our sophisticated goals in education and conservation will stay wishful thinking. There is no alternative to conservation and education, but they need an accepted zoo as platform. In this context, EASA Council and AGM approved the EASA mission the EASA vision and the EASA strategy 2021 to 2025, which I beg you to read and incorporate in your daily work and your strategic master planning of your institution. In the director's report, you soon will hear a more detailed insight from my fund with Griffiths. As mentioned at the beginning, virtual conferences are not nice and it was not easy to make the decision to cancel the face-to-face -face conference in the beginning of this year. Especially if you consider all the work which was already done by our host and by the EASA Executive Office. In the name of all of us, I firstly thank the team of Helsinki Zoo, led by Director Sanna Hellström, for all the preparation and due to the fact that she is member of the EASA Executive Com Committee, she had to decide against her own, her own wish for a sure remarkable conference in Helsinki. Dear Sanna, please pass our thankfulness for your work and your efforts to your team at your zoo. Not to mention the work done at our executive office. After cancelling the face-to-face -face conference with all the preparations beforehand, the work started again to enable a virtual conference with the potential of 800 and plus attendees. Dear my Fanwe, well done until now. And as I said to be Susanna before, please pass our thanks to the team of the, of the EASA Executive Office. Before I hand over to our keynote speaker, Martin Harper, Regional Director Europe and Central Asia at BirdLife International, and thank you for your time and time, and I'm very much looking forward to your speech, Martin. I herewith declare open the 2021 EASA annual conference. I wish you fruitful discussions, wise decisions, and open brains for the colleagues' arguments, which may not yours, and do always remember, EASA is not them, EASA is us. Thank you very much. And now I hand over to Martin Harper. Great, thank you very much indeed, Thomas. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. And I seem to have turned into a thousand Martins. I'll try that again. Um, can I just check you can see that screen? Can someone say if they can? 
I hope you can. I do. Okay, that's great. Um, well, look, morning and many thanks. And I appreciate that all of you are joining this conference in this terrible period of a pandemic, but I hope you're doing okay. And it sounds like it's been quite a tough year for your community and I completely sympathize. Um, I'm just, but that said, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I'm uh, um, Martin Harper, I'm the Regional Director for Europe and Central Asia of BirdLife International, uh, and I've actually been in post for three months, um, but I already feel at home. Um, but I'm pleased to be speaking to you all about the challenges that we all face in trying to tackle the nature and climate emergency. Uh, I've always valued the relationship between in situ and ex situ conservation ever since that uh, I saw for the first time Przewalski's horse at a reintroduction site in Mongolia in 1994. Uh, and although this image is from Kazakhstan, it just gives you an illustration of just the extraordinary inspiration that big major reintroduction programs can have, you know, particularly when we're talking about these extraordinary creatures like Przewalski's horse. Um, and previously to working for BirdLife, I actually was the conservation director for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, which is the UK partner of BirdLife. And I was there for 17 years. And in that time, many of the key conservation success stories that the RSPB had were very much done in collaboration with IASA members, such as Zoological Society of London, Paint and Zoo, Frankfurt Zoological Society. And so I know the impact that that collaboration can have. So for example, this small little bird here is the cell bunting. Uh, and uh, we worked with the Azaza partners to try and reintroduce this, this bird to uh, parts of the southwest of England, to Cornwall. Uh, and as a result of that enterprise, we saw a tenfold increase in this very threatened bird. Uh, we also supported the reintroduction of corn crake to the southern parts of England to try and connect with its northernmost population in Scotland. And by collaboration with the IASA members, we were able to show that ongoing persecution of iconic birds of prey species like red kite were thwarting their recovery. But it wasn't just in the UK we were doing collaboration. Also here, one of the um, gyps vultures of Asia, as many of you will be aware, they've declined massively as a result of um, the inadvertent that poisoned by diclofenac, a drug being used um, in cattle for veterinary purposes. And we're now establishing a rear and release program for Asian vultures to try and re-establish their populations in the world. And we're also collaborating on some of the most extraordinary large scale conservation projects on the planet. Uh, here we're working together to try and uh, protect the Saiga antelope on a place called Altindala in Kazakhstan, which is really the Serengeti of the north. And what I really, the reason why I wanted to start here with all of these projects is because it demonstrates the extraordinary work that we can do together to try and improve the natural world. And reintroductions and habitat restoration um, can give us optimism and hope that we can turn things round for the future. So what I want to do today is I want to offer a brief comment on the state of the planetary crisis. I want to share some ideas about how we can turn the UN decade on ecological restoration and make it more than just words. And I shall offer a challenge to all of us working in nature conservation. But first of all, I want to say, I want to really introduce you to BirdLife International. So some of you may be aware that we are um, the largest global partnership of independent organizations operating around the world. Uh, there's something that I think we now have 120 partners uh, and we're all united about the need to restore nature. And we're supported by something like 10 million um, partners around the world. Uh, and we, we were born in 93 um, out of the International Council of Bird Preservation, which actually started in 19. 22. So next year we shall be celebrating our centenary uh, and it will be a great coming together, hopefully in person in the UK next year. 
In terms of my region, well, uh, in green, you can see the uh, 45 um, countries where we are active. As you can see, uh, my region is one of six of the, of the BirdLife partners, uh, BirdLife Secretariat region. And we go from Iceland in the west through to Kazakhstan uh, in the east, and we do cover Israel with all of the countries in between. And it is a diverse and active region. And the partners that we work with are not only active within um, the European and Central Asian region, they also work with other partners elsewhere. Uh, our approach really starts with birds because we think they are um, ambassadors for the rest of nature. And of course, we have particular expertise. But we say we have two foundations of partnership and science uh, and four pillars of our work. The partnership really is actually absolutely at the heart of what we do. And we try and grow our collective capability and capacity around the world to, to have impact for nature. But we invest in science both in terms of trying to identify the most important areas for biodiversity. And we run the important bird area program and we're partners of the key biodiversity areas initiative, but also we are the red list authority of birds, therefore assessing uh, the extinction risk that birds around the world face. In terms of our four uh, um, pillars, uh, we work on species to recover threatened species. We work on sites to identify, protect and restore sites to contribute to wider landscape scale conservation or indeed in the marine environment. We seek to change the system by influencing the key drivers of biodiversity loss, whether it's agriculture or over exploitation of the marine environment. And of course, we engage with society to try and encourage them to campaign for change and to take action in their own lives. So we, many of you will be aware of some of the work that BirdLife does. And I wanted to start actually with our support of your really effective silent forest uh, campaign, which of course has been trying to raise awareness and raise funds over the, to try and tackle the impact of trade on Asian songbirds. Uh, and I think it's been fantastic to see that that campaign has raised more than a half a million uh, dollars to support conservation action in parts of Asia, um, because obviously there is still a growing extinction risk associated with trade pressures, particularly because of the uh, enthusiasm for having cage birds such as this minor bird here. Um, but also within Europe, um, we're perhaps best known for some of our lobbying work, uh, so um, back in the uh, late 70s and then in the early 90s, actually, it was BirdLife Partners who helped to craft the EU nature directives, both the Birds Directive and the Habitats and Species Directive. This probably provides the toughest legal protection for wildlife anywhere on the planet. But unfortunately, back in 2014, uh, these directives were at risk. Um, when Claude Juncker became the European president, he was looking to review these directives with a view to potentially watering them down uh, and BirdLife collaborating with many other nature conservation organizations mounted a vehement campaign to try and keep those directives intact. And as you can see, um, that collective campaign generated more than half a million signatures. And I was delighted uh, when we were able to celebrate the fact that the directives were not going to be unpacked. And since then, we've been working very hard to influence the EU Green Deal. And I'll come back to that later, because um, I hope this is a chance for the EU to show a leadership role. But we don't just do lobbying work. We do do a lot of work with transboundary species. So obviously, many birds migrate. Uh, and so here is, you know, are two turtle doves, which are the fastest declining migratory birds. And they have problems on their breeding grounds because of loss of food and because of disease. But also they are a target species, a quarry species, and many people do continue to shoot them uh, on, on, on their migration. And of course, they have problems in their wintering grounds in West Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and what we've been trying to do is very much try to um, encourage both uh, changing agricultural policy, but also to try and put in place new measures to curb the impact on hunting. And it was great to be able to celebrate um, the French, the Portuguese and the Spanish and indeed Israeli governments recently introducing moratoriums on the hunting of this threatened species. Uh, and But we had to carry on doing a huge amount of um, uh, 
lobbying on this work to try and convince other countries across their range to reduce the impact of hunting. And elsewhere, um, you may be aware of the work that we do um, in the marine environment to reduce the bycatch of, um, of seabirds from fishing. Um, here, sadly, is an image of a gannet which is being caught um, in a hook. Uh, and both, this isn't just an issue which affects the southern seas. Many of you will be aware of the work of our albatross task force, which is trying to reduce the loss of albatrosses from longline fishing, something like 300,000 albatrosses a year um, are caught each year. Uh, and we've managed to um, reduce the impact and some fisheries up to 96%. Um, by working with fishermen to help them to catch fish rather than seabirds. Um, but this is not just a problem in the southern seas. Um, in, in, in European waters, for example, 200,000 um, birds die each year, and some of them, because of the indiscriminate nature of the fishing um, practices, potentially can affect threatened species such as the Balearic um, shearwater. Um, but the good news is that we have been working very hard to try and get an EU bycatch uh, action plan in place to try and reduce the impact of these seabirds. We've got a long, lot of work still to do, but it shows that the power of the partnership when it comes together can deliver at least the intent for action. So the work that um, bird life partners do, and indeed you know, what we all do, is absolutely vital. However, the nature of, our, of the climate and nature emergency means that we have to do so much more. So we have to deliver a step change. And I think that um, over this past summer, uh, just events around the world, it's, it's been really difficult not to be deeply affected by what's been going on. Um, there's been floods in China, India, in Germany. There's been devastating fires in Siberia, North America, and indeed the Mediterranean. And of course, there's been droughts and famine in southern Madagascar. Um, and it, it's just showing that the climate crisis is here, it's now, it's biting, and it's affecting um, us all and indeed our livelihoods. But it's not just humans that are affected. Um, this, these are some images of um, what happened in, um, uh, in a lake called Lake Taz in Anatolia in Turkey, um, where essentially a combination of drought and unsustainable irrigation has essentially led to this habitat being lost uh, and there was a really horrifying video which was taken by um, a volunteer for our Turkish of our Turkish bird life partner which basically showed thousands of baby flamingos dying because they were unable to essentially uh, get food uh, as a result of this combination of drought and unsustainable irrigation. So while shocking, um, really none of this should have come as a surprise because we've known the impact of climate, climate change for, you know, for nearly decades. And of course, earlier um, this year, the IPCC came out with its latest report issuing a code red for humanity, saying that unless we take action fast, uh, then we really are on a collision course with catastrophic climate change. And this follows early reports from 2019, um, including from the International Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, that unless we transform our economies, then potentially a million species will be put at risk. So that is the challenge which we're all facing into at the moment. And the, the good news, I suppose, is that we're beginning to see signs that their political response is growing. Uh, and so um, there's obviously three big things taking place, uh, you know, at the moment. So we have the major talks for the two global summits of the Convention on Biological Diversity and, of course, COP26, where hopefully we'll be able to agree global deals for nature and indeed for climate change. Uh, and that will be demonstrating the p political intent for action. And the UN itself has dedicated this decade as um, a, to put a focus on ecosystem restoration. Uh, and, and really for us, the challenge is to really try and ensure that the words that politicians utter are then translated into action. And it has to be a transformational decade. This is the decade where we have to turn things around. And my belief is we have to do three things this decade. We have to stop the rot, protect the best and restore the rest. And what do I mean by that? Well, 
stop the rot sadly still has to take place because we have to continue to try and stop the exploitation of the natural world and to move away from an economy that is dependent on um, environmental degradation. We have to protect the best and that means we have to try and look towards more of our land and sea to be well protected and managed, embracing the campaign for 30% of land and sea to be protected by 2030 and of course to try and ensure that some of our most vulnerable species are getting protection and restore the rest. So there's, we believe that we should be looking to restore 15% of our land and sea over the next decade. And of course, we think that we should be where, the, where it's the right thing to do to reintroduce lost species. So that really is what I would interpret as the ambition of the UN decade of ecological restoration. Um, but we need governments to lead because only governments can set the overall ambition and strategy because they will be the ones sitting around the table in those summits of CBD and UNFCCC. So they have to agree the right ambition. Uh, and at the same time, they then need to translate whatever they agree globally into national and regional plans. But again, only governments can agree policies and laws. So they need to underpin those global commitments in domestic legislation. And they need to end the perverse subsidies such as agriculture policies, which reward farmers just for farming rather than for um, looking after the land for wildlife. And we need only governments can grow the public finance for nature, either through public spending um, or indeed through en enabling the conditions for private investment. And they can signal to business that they need to change. And only governments can regularly report on progress and encourage public sc scrutiny. We need governments to be transparent about the way in which they're making progress uh, against their major targets. There are some promising signs. We've seen, for example, more than 70 countries sign up to the Leaders' Pledge for Nature. Uh, we've also seen this new high ambition coalition, which is calling for 30% of land and seas to be protected. And equally within the European Union, for example, under the EU Green Deal, we've now seen the publication of an EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, which I think is one of the most progressive documents that I've seen for nature conservation. So it has very clear targets for protecting nature, including 30 by 30, but also for restoring nature. And I believe that if it's passed, the EU will be the first um, legislative body to have a legal target for restoration for nature and the European Parliament has actually exceeded what I think even the nat nature the NGOs were calling for by calling for 30 percent um, of habitat to be restored and then enabling the transformation or change is obviously to try and um, influence the um, commercial sectors and then what they're trying to do, I believe rightly, is to then align the EU's own uh, domestic agenda with that of its international agenda to make sure that uh, its considerable commitments to overseas development assistance supports these major ambitions. So there are some, this is the sort of leadership that we need, but at the same time, what about NGOs? Well, we need to do what we do best, which is of course, translate science into action and to inspire the public through everything that we do. But I'm gonna give you four challenges, which I think are relevant to all NGOs, um, whether we're, we're members of the EASA community or birdlife community. The first thing is we have to continue to fight unsustainable exploitation of nature. As I said, we have to stop the rot. And it is an inconvenient truth. That we continue to have to um, put effort into stopping even the hunting of our most threatened species like turtle dove. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's mad that that's still allowed to continue today. But equally, we've had to spend an enormous amount of effort trying to outlaw some barbaric practices, such as the use of lime sticks. Only just now have we had, um, uh, this, this summer, have we had lime sticks being ruled as illegal. But we have to keep on um, um, fighting the unsustainable exploitation of nature, because unless we do, it'll continue. The second thing we must do is we must claim the truth. So what do I mean by that? Well, as I said, the governments around the world will be making big, bold commitments um, over the coming months about what they're going to do for nature. Uh, and, and here is an example of how I think 
we we as NGOs need to be talking truth to power because um, the UK government, for example, has signed up to a commitment of um, 30% of land and sea to be protected by 2030. And they're thinking, well, that's not a big effort because something like 27% of UK land is currently protected. And so we only need 3% more. Well, the reality is if, if we're interpreting that target from, uh, from, a, from a, a wildlife perspective, then we've got to make sure that the land that is protected is also wealth managed. And some work that uh, my former colleagues at the RSPB did was basically map the sort of protected areas in the United Kingdom and then ordered them by the IUC and categories, which basically um, um, category five is the one where um, lots of human activity can take place. Uh, and what this map basically shows is that only 11% of UK land is currently protective for wildlife purposes. And if you then look at government's own statistics for how much of that land is well managed, then sadly, only 5% of the UK is currently well protected and managed for nature. So I would argue the truth is that in order to meet the 2030 target, we will need a sixth fold increase from where we are now from where we need to be at the end of the decade. And that should be the conversation with government. I'm pretty sure that this example of the UK is um, replicated around the world. There's an enormous effort to do to try and protect and manage 30% of land and sea. And the third thing we must do is to make sure that we tackle the nature and climate crises together. I've spent too long over the last two decades trying to make the case for the energy revolution that's needed to tackle the climate crisis to take place in harmony with nature, to ensure that renewable energy, which is of course needed, mustn't be at the cost of nature. Um, and equally, there's now a lot of focus on, on the emissions from land use. And I think mapping exercise such as this um, one here, which I'm showing, which came from a paper from O'Connor, can be incredibly helpful in identifying where you can invest effort to deliver both for wildlife, but also for, um, for ecosystem services and also, for example, tackling climate change. And you can see the, the red areas on this map are where you can deliver both for, 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 for people and for uh, nature. And in the Convention on Biological Diversity's draft um, biodiversity framework, there is a commitment now to try and deliver something like 10 gigatons of CO2 equivalent through investment and restoring in nature. And it shows the real power of nature in tackling climate change. And then the fourth thing is we must speak out against inconsistent policies. Uh, it was sadly the case that um, no sooner had the um, ink dried on the new EU biodiversity strategy outlining all those wonderful commitments that I outlined earlier, that with the next breath, um, the EU basically agreed to a common agricultural policy, which will lock in environmentally negative practices. And we have to call that out. Uh, the same thing happened in France, where just last week, um, having ended the use of lime sticks in France, President Macron then sanctioned the continued killing of over 100,000 birds. And I think it's for us as an NGO community to call that out, to say you cannot on the one hand claim to be an environmental leader while at the same time putting in place policies which really um, will affect the natural world. And we need to call that out quite very, very clearly. And finally, um, just really to close, I want to close where I sort of started, which is that oh, I'm just going to summarise our challenges. So our, our challenge really is to fight unsustainable exploitation of the natural world, claim the truth, tackle the nature and climate emergency together and call out inconsistent policies. That's really the gauntlet I wanted to offer you. But I wanted to end on an upbeat note because um, in my whole time working uh, in nature conservation over the last 25 years, I've worked for organisations and worth, worked with organisations who have made things better. Conservation must never be just about documenting decline. It is about making um, the natural world better. And I believe the work that you've done in collaboration with conservation, um, other conservation NGOs and the work that we've done in collaboration with you and others have demonstrated that our work can restore um, habitats, we can um, recover threatened species. Uh, and that is the that gives us the optimism and hope that we can turn things around 
and make the planet better for wildlife and for people. Um, that's our mission. And I know that all of you have agreed to accept it. And it's been delightful speaking to you today. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Martin. Um, a really great overview of uh, the challenges ahead, but also uh, what I really enjoyed was the consistent reminder about our partnership working and the opportunities that we have to really make a difference uh, going forwards together. So um, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm sure there might be some questions that pop up in the chat and we'll have some opportunities to answer them if we have time in this session. But um, uh, following on from that, I would like to be able to share an update on Yaza activities over the last 12 months as well, and hopefully pick up on some common themes from the previous presentations. And if I have clicked the buttons correctly, you should hopefully uh, see my slide up on the screen. And then I will um, make a start. So for many of us, as indeed Thomas said, we're here in another online conference. COVID is still with us. We're in still this time of change. But really more and more now, I am seeing this time of change as a time of chance. Chance to get to know colleagues online that we might never have got to meet if we were in person. Chance to think about the sustainability of our travel and consumption habits when we're in this changing environment. A chance to think about how we might want to expand our activities, how we might want to take up new arts and crafts. For example, uh, participants on our Introduction to Ex situ Management course would usually come to the Yaza office here in Amsterdam and get to know each other and how to manage their programmes in person. But we had to transform, we had to change and take that chance for all of these people to demonstrate their wonderful online artistic skills and connect in an online course instead. And I'm very impressed by the skills shown here of a variety of uh, program species and indeed favorite species demonstrated by our course participants. Much more artistic talent than I could ever have. And I think that theme of, chain, of changing change into chances is going to be throughout my presentation. But one thing that doesn't change is me looking at the strategy work that we've been carried out. And hopefully this is a very familiar slide for everybody now as we reach the end of our IASA strategy from 2017 to 2020. And I just want to give a roundup of where we reached at the end of last year. And considering what a year 2020 was, I'm super pleased that over that entire strategic period, 80% of our actions were completed. There's a small percentage that had to roll over. Some of those actually indicated before last year that we wanted longer to make sure that we achieved the right outcomes. And some of them just got delayed by COVID impacts. But if we look across all four of our focal areas, we can see really great progress in all of those areas. So I think we should be exceedingly pleased by where we've come to at the end of that strategic period. But then looking forwards, in my presentation last year, I put up this quote by Alice Walker to really focus us into our new strategy, looking closely at the present we're constructing, and it should look like the future that we're dreaming. And indeed, when we were putting together our new vision and mission and the new strategy for 21 to 25, we had to make some changes to that and or review whether our ambition was still going to be um, appropriate in the new world that we're entering. And actually, in terms of that, I think it's more relevant now than ever. So in terms of, of our agreed new vision and mission from 21, uh, 2021 onwards, we're looking to be progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you. Very much that with you is picking up on all the partnership work we do with other NGOs like BirdLife, but also with our visitors, with governments, with indeed other members and non-member zoos and aquariums as well. And we're going to be achieving that vision through our revised mission, being an organization that's setting the standard for progressive zoos and aquariums and indeed other partners across Europe, Western Asia and beyond. We're looking to achieve that vision by defining and demonstrating excellence in integrated species conservation. That species conservation is at the heart of what we do. We're wanting to be transparent and collaborative and working in the fields of population management, wild animal care and welfare, and representation within international organizations. Indeed, as Martin was saying, it's important more than ever that we hold governments accountable for the biodiversity that we're all working together to preserve. And of course, there's a large part of that involving conservation education and scientific research. 
And we're looking to achieve our vision and our mission through these five focal areas. So we're looking to add an additional focal area to here your spot on the left hand side there about elements of managing our operations to reduce our environmental footprint. And through these focal areas, through our work together in these areas, that's how we're going to achieve that vision of being progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you. And indeed, with you, of course, is our membership. And this is indeed one of my favourite images, just to demonstrate the diversity and the strength of our IASA community. We're 430 members across 48 countries. So we are indeed a strong and diverse community working together to achieve that vision. And one of the things that helps us in that is our accreditation program. And this is possibly one of the areas of our work that has been hit the hardest by the COVID crisis because we were unable to travel. And then perhaps we could travel. Thank you to all those members that said, oh, maybe we could come and visit you towards the end of last year or early this year when we thought it would be possible. And then we had to rearrange. But fingers crossed, screenings have begun again. We are starting to open up and have safer travel. We've already had two screenings carried out so far. And then we have more planned for October and through to April 2022. So thank you to everybody who's put their hands up for those. In terms of our decisions, we were able to make some uh, throughout this period. We have one new temporary member. One temporary member has been made up to full and one full member made temporary. And also during this period, we welcome three new corporate members into IASA. When we look at our accreditation programme, if you've done your maths there and, and had a think about the fact that we weren't able to do very many screenings, it won't be a surprise for you to hear that we're at 74% of the membership being fully accredited. That's the value that we were last year and the year before in terms of not being able to carry out those screenings. So that meant that our plan cycle to be finished, ideally by the end of this year, has got to be postponed slightly but all members are due to be screened by the end of 2023 or sooner. And this is definitely where we'll be looking around the room if we were there in person to catch a few of you's eyes to say, definitely uh, pop your hand up. We would love to come and visit you, love to get you uh, screened and being part of our IRASA accreditation program so that we reach that 100% um, you know, by 2023 or before. Within this slide, I also have a little on the left hand side there, the IASA conservation logo. And this is a reminder, there'll be more than one of them throughout this presentation about adding your data to our IASA conservation database. Because one of the things we look at when we come to screen our members is the conservation activities. And if you've added your data to the conservation database, then it's all there ready for us to see at the press of a button. So definitely an encouragement to add your data to the database as part of assisting with the smooth screening process. So this is where we are in the breakdown of those 430 members across our different membership categories. I next just wanted to talk about a little bit about the staff changes that we've had within the executive office over the past year. It's, it's um, uh, been um, definitely a time of change, but also a chance to welcome some new colleagues as well. I'm going to start over on the right hand side of the screen with Zoe Andre, our office coordinator, who um, uh, through uh, one reason or another decided that it was the time for her to set up a new life in Spain. So she left us and was replaced. Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, all right, because they're changing on my screen. So let me just. Okay. Uh, so if I stop screen sharing and then start again. Excellent. Well, some behind the scenes trickery. It seems like apparently my slides stopped on this one. I kept talking, um, uh, but the slides didn't uh, didn't keep changing. So we just hopefully are, are back on. And um, I was telling you about our new vision and mission. And then our four focal areas, or indeed five. I need to up my numbers in the new strategy. Still haven't got that fully in my head. Uh, and then the map of our members in terms of being 430 members across 48 countries. So just to demonstrate the strength and the diversity within our IASA community. And then I talked a little bit, hopefully you could still hear about the screening. 
talks that have been going on. So definitely um, uh, welcome to those uh, new members and thank you very much for anybody that's put their hand up to be screened. Um, we have uh, had some new members join us and indeed looking to have all of our members screened by the end of 2023 or sooner so that 74% that of EASA members that are fully accredited will become 100% and then we'll restart the cycle again. I know our accreditation and membership manager April is keen to hear from you so please do contact her so that we can schedule in your screening. And this was the slide just with the overview of how our 430 members are broken down into the different membership categories. And then moving on to just talk about um, the changes that we've seen within the executive office. So I was talking about our office coordinator on the right hand side here, Zoe Andre, uh, moving to create a new life in Spain. And she was replaced by Laura as our new office coordinator earlier this year. Many of you will remember that I introduced Minyu to you as our new communications officer during annual conference last year. She had a specific role to help us set up and expand our Instagram account. And I'll talk a little bit more about what's happened with that later on in this presentation. But hers was a short term contract under life. So we were very pleased with her work, but, um, but her contract finished. So we said good luck and goodbye to her. Many of you as program coordinators will have interacted with Micah as our assistant population biologist. And although Micah is lost to the ERs at executive office, she is not lost to the community. She has gone on to an exciting new role with one of our associate members at Van Hal Larenstein University. So teaching the new generation of population biologists. So we're wishing Micah every success there. And her role and duties are going to be replaced by Marie. Marie was also with us as part of some support through life funding and so able to step into Micah's shoes and continue on those roles. And I'm also delighted to say that we have uh, got two new, what we're terming external population biologists here in Eva and Charlotte. These are population biologists based in both Prague Zoo and Malus, who are sponsored by those zoos. So we're extremely grateful to the leadership and the support shown by both of those institutions to really make sure we have a strong and successful population um, uh, management centre and a PMC team of staff ready to assist in all of our programme decisions. So a very warm welcome to Eva and Charlotte. I'm sure many of you have already had opportunities to interact with them throughout the year. Anya, who is our biobank coordinator um, in this brand new role, has been excellent in, in getting the biobank up and running and working with many of you to really establish this new part of our structure. Anya has been lured away to America by a super exciting PhD opportunity. She's still with us for a few days a week while we are looking for her replacements. We are very close to announcing the successful candidates, so definitely watch this space for announcements on our new biobank coordinator. Earlier this year as well, we also had short-term contracted uh, piece of work for Anna Marika here, who helped us develop a BSAL massive open online course, a MOOC coordinator. And we were super uh, pleased with the work that Anna Marika was able to do with the tag in relation to that. And I'll talk a bit more about that too. But that was a short-term role, so we very much thanked Anna Marika for her work and said goodbye to her. We've also welcomed in Annika and Pip as animal welfare volunteers to support both the Animal Welfare Forum next year and our social media and animal welfare Facebook page as well. So many thanks to Annika and Pip for joining us as animal welfare volunteers. And one last position that has been open for a while because of uh, us not being able to carry out accreditation is an accreditation coordinator post. We've interviewed for this position. And again, it's a little bit of a wait and see till we announce the successful candidate. So quite a few changes within the executive office over the past 12 months, but a lot of chances here to meet wonderful new colleagues and wish ones that are leaving us well in their new roles. Another piece of work that was hit by the COVID crisis or indeed needed to transition into new forms has been our academy. And although the numbers here in terms of training and certified participants, et cetera, is lower than what we'd expect because we had fewer opportunities for face-to-face -face courses, we, of course, then did have the opportunity to engage with more people in different ways online. And this is where, for example, that BSAL MOOC has been exceedingly successful. We've had over 450 people uh, register online to do this course. It's, it's a free open course. It's self-paced. You go through it at your own time. And uh, there is the possibility to download a completion certificate as well. And 70 people so far have done that. 
And what I find really um, encouraging is that this is a course that has been initially developed for our community, but it's seeing uh, use and benefits much more broader than that. We've got this great quote here from a museum curator. We are having people at universities, private collections, etc., all making use of this excellent resource. So definitely check that out if you're looking to help uh, manage BSAL and, uh, and uh, mitigate the devastating consequences of it. We're also able to offer some online training in collaboration with some of our members. So we're able to run this conservation education evaluation course in collaboration with Chester Zoo. Again, with a lot of opportunities for people to join online that might not have made it if they were in person. And last year when we had to change from having our animal welfare forum in person to a range of animal welfare webinars, that's now become an established part of practice. And these tend to happen on about a monthly basis. Again, um, they're free to join. You register and can watch them online live or catch them again on our YouTube. And we have had up to 50 attendees at these webinars. So again, a super popular and useful resource um, for everybody, uh, both within and outside the ERSA community. And last but not least, I wanted to highlight our um, online uh, self-paced course, A Journey Through Life, highlighting opportunities for EU life funding for members to help expand and underpin their conservation activities. This is just going through an annual update, and you'll hear more about that uh, coming up in an e-news announcement later on uh, this year. So definitely, if you're looking to find additional funding for your conservation work, this tutorial is a great place to start. And what's up for the Academy next? Well, actually, again, this is a chance for us to think about how we manage our programs. So we will continue with some online training uh, for the different course areas that you'll see up there. Fingers crossed, travel and restrictions will be easing and we've planned some in-person training throughout next year on a range of topics from EEP management through to conservation communication and exhibit design. And of course, we also are developing more opportunities for these self-paced online training courses. The, the um, interactions we've seen with that BSAL MOOC have really enabled us to think about different ways and develop different ways to offer training. So we'll be looking to expand provision there in terms of animal welfare and meeting of conservation education standards. So definitely keep checking back on the Academy pages on the main website to find out um, in more information about how you can enroll and join in these various training opportunities. So that then brings us to looking at our strategy and the five focal areas and the work that we've been carrying out underneath these over the past 12 months. And we're going to start off with leading in zoo and aquarium animal management and care. And as always, there's been a variety of changes that we've been processing in relation to our tags, EEPs, ESBs and non-EASA EP participants. Again, showing the, the changes and the chances within our community to make sure that we're maintaining uh, inclusiveness and vibrancy. Part of our program is also to run these regional collection plan or RCP workshops. And these initially were designed to be face to face, but they've transitioned really successfully to an online format. I hear nothing but positive feedback from them. And I'm really pleased that we've been able to keep up the pace and on track with the range of workshops that we have wanted to do um, without too much slippage due to COVID-19 changes. Also, of course, underpinning the work that we do, we're wanting to look to update our terms of office for TAG chairs and vice chairs, and indeed start that new cycle of TAG evaluations as we're in our new population management structure. Another area that is constantly reviewed and updated is our very valuable population management manual. And one particular area that's been updated in the past 12 months is uh, around procedures to do with ownership, use and access to stud book data. And you can find all that information reflected in chapter 3.12. So definitely uh, opportunities to find out how, who can get access to stud book data to help us with management of our programs. And I have to give a massive call out to everybody that's been involved in developing and publishing our IASA best practice guidelines. It's continued to be a tough year throughout 2020. Not everybody was open at the beginning of the year. There were still people working on furlough, but our program coordinators, their supportive species committees have been excellent in developing and producing these best practice guidelines for a full range of species. And also I'm delighted to see that we're able to collect information for areas such as virus management for parrots. Again, um, freely available on the IASA main website, a fantastic resource for both our community and anybody looking to take better care of the animals uh, within their care. 
I mentioned those regional uh, collection plans or RCPs and so this is where we are really looking to clearly identify which species we're looking to keep within our, our community and why. And so these are very collaborative approaches. You can see very many faces there in our online Zoom. Uh, opportunities to get both in situ and ex situ community uh, stakeholders together to make sure that we're uh, managing our, our species and choosing the species that we can have the most success with. Uh, we can see the list of ones that have been approved now and are in the ERs and member area. Again, that conservation EASA logo is there to remind you that adding data to your conservation database is another way that that data is used within this RCP process where we can see opportunities where we already have members working with species in situ. So definitely another call to add your data. We've also held a number of workshops and so these reports are just in the uh, process of being finalised now. So definitely keep your eye out for those, they'll be coming through. And again, just delighted to see the volume of work that's gone on here. Congratulations to everybody involved. This is no small task. And I know there's been some tough decisions on uh, species choices and identifying the roles and goals for those species. Which brings me nicely on to this next slide because coming out of that RCP process then is the decision on which of the new EASA ex situ programs or EEPs would be approved. And we're up to 178 so far, again, across a range of species that are coming out of those tags. So if we're looking at our five-year process to transition everything across to the new style EEP, you can see that green bar uh, um, under the new style EEP is increasing and under the old style EEP, ESB is decreasing over time until we have none left. The important thing to note here as well, those of you that are quick on your sums will note that the overall total figure is increasing year on year as well. And so what this means is that out of that RCP process, it's not just a straightforward, oh, this is an old style EEP, it's now a new style EEP. We're adding to those EEPs and or adapting them to really make sure that the programs that we're managing uh, are going to be fulfilling the roles and goals that we have the skills and abilities to achieve. And that then brings me on to more details about how we're going to achieve those roles and goals. So for each of those new style EEPs, we're then looking to develop these long-term management plans. And so this then is a more detailed, usually five-year structure of how we want to manage those programs so that we can reach those roles and goals, what decisions need to be made as a community. Again, a really good range of species there. Definitely, I think, as the as the years go on, I'm running out of space to list all the species because we really are ramping this up well. Uh, thanks to everybody involved in that. And again, you can find these within the ERs at member area. And I uh, mentioned elements in the ERs at member area, but also you'll remember when we talked about our mission here is to be transparent and open and sharing of best practice. And so this is why I'm also delighted that we're taking that information that we've covered through this RCP LTMP EEP process and looking to develop them and put them onto the main EASA website onto these EEP pages. You can see the range of species that we have up there already and there are some you know blank spaces because we're adding to them all the time and this is a wonderful opportunity for members both within and outside the EASA community to find out more about our program. So for example you might click on the Shavolsky horse and this gives you an idea of who the coordinator is, which of our members is managing it, and the status of that species. You can scroll, scroll down the page and then this is what has come out of all of those collaborative workshops, the direct and indirect conservation roles and goals um, that we are identifying for the species. And these are different for each of the species and give a really clear indication of uh, why we're keeping these species in our care and what we're expecting to achieve from these programs. This also gives us a much clearer indication of being able to track the success and the abilities of these programs. And continue scrolling on down, there's more information about the programme numbers, highlights and additional resources such as best practice guidelines. I switched from the Shavosky horse to our uh, uh, spider here, just I don't want to be accused of being too mammal centric because I really think um, one of the, the wonderful uh, things about our community is that we are really diverse in the range of species and expertise that we're able to share. So definitely take a look for those EEP pages, they're a, a wonderful place to find out more about our programmes. <coughs> and uh, last but not least, of course, underpinning those programmes is the wonderful work that we need to do in terms of our stud book decisions. And it's definitely been a process of migrating all of our stud books 
um, into the new Zimsa stud books um, functionality. So we've now moved 518 stud books across. So massive congratulations. Definitely, if I was seeing you in person, I'd be encouraging rounds of applause for everybody involved in this. There are a few stud books that need additional functionality that we just need to finalize, but I think we should really celebrate this success. And if you're a new coordinator, or indeed you feel like you just need a bit of support or training within the ZIMS environment, we've developed an online ZIMS stud book training trajectory. So this is an online self-paced course, and there definitely are some guidelines as well for how to help manage that. So definitely reach out if you need any help, take the advantage of these great training resources. I mentioned uh, Anya and setting up of the Biobank and definitely with the Biobank working group and indeed partners throughout the community, we've really seen a massive growth of the Biobank. So thank you to everybody who has been sending in those samples, um, indeed making it part of their daily routines when they're collecting um, samples to send one off to the Biobank so we can have a really good range of species and institutions adding to that. And of course, I do like my data, so I'm also really pleased that we've been able to develop the uh, Biobank sample storage module within ZIMS. And this is really integrating all of our data together so that we're able to pick up the information from Biobank information, from Studbook information, from ZIMS for Husbandry, to have a really comprehensive, holistic set of data around the species and the decisions that we need to make for them. A lot of work has been going on with communications and outreach and indeed integrating historical collections into the biobank. Um, we're really uh, grateful for those um, collections that have given their samples into our care. A lot of curation and registration for that, but we're definitely looking to make that process as smooth as possible so we can really have the best uh, uh, and highest number of samples within the biobank. And as we're increasing that biobank capacity, the one area that we haven't yet um, moved to for us directly is cryopreservation. And that again is where partnership work comes in, that with you. We're looking to expand into making partnerships with cryopreservation services and um, looking to expand the range of uh, samples and cell lines that we can keep to really make this as strong as possible. And linking to that, of course, is forging these global connections in making sure that we're able to use the data that we have in the biobank to carry out appropriate research to help us make effective decisions about population management. So thank you to everybody and definitely a call out to continue sending your samples into the biobank or start sending them if you're not doing so already. And that leads us quite nicely into our second focal area about maximizing our conservation impact and engagement. And so I've mentioned it a few times already and hopefully people are aware of our IASA conservation database and the range of ways that we publicize and promote the information within the database really as a way to thank the members that are adding that information. So we have information on our main website. You can go back and look through the archives. We um, uh, have a monthly snapshot that goes out in social media and we demonstrate um, the range of projects in the database for that year within the annual report and year on year those pages are increasing. So please do add your data to the conservation database. It's a great opportunity to share with the world the wonderful conservation work that you're doing but also part of the strategic focal area is about maximizing our conservation impact and by sharing this information we're able to look for synergies look for ways that we can work together to maximize these conservation opportunities and then the one new step that we've developed in the last year is our conservation database map again available from the main EASA website and this puts the projects in the database into an interactive format. So you can see here about the range of projects that are going on and you can filter by year or member species and continent. So if like me, you're maybe a bit of a fan of the pigs and peccaries, you can filter by pigs and peccaries and then this gives you the results in the conservation database for all the different projects that ERs and members have been involved in in relation to that species. Again, a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate the work that we're involved in, the areas we're involved in. And if you're looking to get into pig and peccary conservation, these are ways you can find some synergies and partnerships amongst the ERs and membership as well. So definitely take a look at that map. And indeed, the more members that add their data to the database, the stronger and more holistic that map becomes. I'm talking of members adding data to the database. Another one of my favorite uh, uh, infographics is this one on our contributions to con conservation that is pulled from the data that's been added to the database. So this image here is where we were at at 2019. 
And I must admit, you know, knowing how hard our members were hit in 2020, I was a little bit nervous about how the 2020 conservation infographic was going to look. Uh, you know, was it going to be really quite heartbreaking because um, so many zoos had to make very difficult choices about the finances that they had available. But actually, I think we should be really, really proud of ourselves as a zoo community because, yes, the total number of um, euros and staff hours has decreased, but really only slightly uh, considering how badly impacted our members were throughout 2020. We have had more members put their data into the database than previously. We've kept a high number of over 600 partners and over 600 species still supported throughout 2020 with our conservation work. We're still carrying out that conservation work across all areas of the globe. We do have a high concentration in Asia, largely a lot to do with elements to do with the songbird crisis, but also identifying that that is an area of high biodiversity loss and where we really need to focus our conservation efforts. So I think we should be really proud as a community um, of, of the work that continued in terms of conservation and our abilities to evidence that throughout 2020 in what was a year that, that could have just seen us really need to pull back. So congratulations to everybody for their continued support for conservation, demonstrating the value of the ERs as zoo and aquarium community in underpinning vital conservation work. One other thing that we're looking to do as well, especially when we reach the end of strategic periods, is take that little glance back and say, well, okay, how have we managed to change and take those chances available to us throughout the strategic period? So this infographic here is a summary of the contribution to conservation from that database throughout the 2016 to 2020 period. And you can see some nice increases there. Of course, we have that slight dip in 2020. But uh, I think it's amazing that over this period, we're evidencing 111 million euros of financial support. And just look at all of that staff time as well, really demonstrating the expertise that the EASA community has to provide to conservation efforts. What I'd like to see when we come to the end of our current strategic period is that we just continue on with these graphs increasing and increasing and indeed reaching maximum numbers of members, partners and species at work that we're looking to do. Another area of our conservation work is our Witch Fish campaign. And uh, I'm not going to say too much about this campaign. We have the campaign plenary later on today. So please join us back to find out what's been happening throughout the Witch Fish campaign in this last year. And then, of course, we move from Witch Fish to what next? And indeed, join the campaign plenary later on today to find out what our next campaign is going to be from an EASA perspective. Moving then into our third focal area about how we're looking to represent our community at the national, EU and global levels. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, one thing that has been vitally important for us has been this EASA response to the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. Uh, we were looking to put together our position statement and we translated that at the request of members into Hungarian and Romanian for better use. I'd definitely like to thank all of our uh, national associations and indeed individual members that reached out to their politicians to discuss our biodiversity uh, position statement with them. And indeed, we had a really nice concentrated piece of work with VDZ when we were uh, the EU presidency was in Germany, and that gave us a really great lobbying opportunity. And for us, I think this was a, a massive uh, success because we saw the first mention of ex situ conservation in an EU political declaration, all part of this lobbying work. So really positioning EASA and our activities at the heart of some EU biodiversity strategy and saying how we can help achieve those strategies. We're continuing to focus on the European Parliament. And indeed, as Martin said before, the, the EU Green Deal is definitely one to keep an eye on and to think about our work in those areas too. Within this field of strategic activity, we've been continually active within the zoo's directive implementation. We attended a stakeholder meeting um, earlier this year to talk about conservation activities and how diverse they can be and how we can assess conservation under the zoo's directive. And indeed, part of a, a, a EU-funded project for better implementation of the zoo's directive we've delivered online training to over 90 people, uh, largely um, uh, local authorities responsible for implementing the zoos directive legislation in your countries but also we had a number of individual members and national associations join us as well that training hopefully if we can manage it is going to take place uh, in our original format of face-to-face -face, uh, earlier next year as well so keep an eye out for invitations to attend that training or encourage your local authorities to attend that training 
as well. We continued our work with invasive alien species or IAS regulation. Uh, there was a slight pause on listing of species, but that's going to be brought back in. I think we're going to have 28 new species being added to the list in December later this year. And we'd like to thank all the tags that responded to requests for information about those risk assessments to make sure that we're having a clear indication of the uh, impacts of invasive alien species and, what, and where and when they can be managed which leads on to the other piece of work that we've been involved in, in terms of facilitating humane IAS management workshops for three EU regions as part of a, a collaborative partnership project as well. Hopefully you're all aware that the new revised updated shiny EU animal health law, AHL, came into force earlier this year. This is a, a great piece of work that's bringing together a range of different animal health legislation into one place. And the Yaza Veterinary Committee, in partnership with EAZWV, have been doing a great amount of work um, throughout the past few years to make sure that that uh, law is fit for purpose. We've spread some guidance documents already and are finalising a handbook that's going to be ready for you for offering more advice and guidance early next year. We continue our work on wildlife trade. Hopefully you'll remember that we had a position statement on tiger trade as IAZA, and that led to us being able to speak on an EU webinar about tiger trade and the impacts of that, both on conservation and specifically within management within the EU. We continued with COVID-19 exchange of information. Again, big thanks to all of our national associations for the great communication and uh, um, collaboration that we've had in making sure that we can share advances and best practices in those areas. We've continued to do some great work with Bayaza colleagues on Brexit. We're aware that there are still some issues in terms of um, health certificates and um, border post control points in terms of movement of animals where some of those certificates and documentation has not been uh, as smooth or as available as we might have wanted. So definitely, um, you know, we're continuing to lobby on your behalf to make sure that animal transports can be effective, can support the welfare of animals and the movement of them to help support our work. That also leads into an EU consultation that we fed back to on animal welfare in transport and indeed the work that we've been doing as IAZA and as individual members signing up to the Global Coalition United for Biodiversity and joining the Together for Forests to lobby against deforestation. Again, really just looking to demonstrate our uh, conservation credentials and expertise in a range of different forums and offer our abilities to help reach combined targets together. And a lot of that was pulled together at a virtual stand at EU Green Week in 2020. I couldn't resist this opportunity to share once again the beautiful avatars of our colleagues, uh, Alan and Tomash there, our EU policy staff, who were virtually in the, in the in EU Green Week, holding the fort there with an IASA stand and sharing our information with EU policymakers during that week. Uh, Alan and Thomas also hosted a virtual EU study visit to Brussels last year, so we're delighted that so many of you joined us from a really good range of countries. We're still trying to finalise whether we're going to be online in person, what our study visit will look at like this year, so stay tuned for updates about that. And if all of this has inspired you to get involved in, in lobby work, then um, definitely have a look at our EU decision-making guidebook for EASA members. This is a great document to give you an introduction to the various complexities of EU decision-making and how and where you can play your part to help make a difference. And if that isn't enough, we have two workshops happening this week as well, both on Wednesday. If you want to know more about the animal health law, then join on Wednesday morning. And more generally, how we are that you and can work with the EU on uh, Wednesday mid-morning as well. So I'm sure we look forward to seeing you there. On the global scale, we've continued to increase our work within CITES heading towards that Conference of the Parties, that COP19. We're looking to continue our work, or we have been continuing our work with WAZA and AZA um, around source and purpose codes, specifically um, on a working group for purpose codes over the past period, and indeed as part of the intersessional working group on appropriate and acceptable destinations. So really kind of, uh, again, adding our expertise in partnership to this important forum. We continue to focus on the species close to our heart, our tigers and our songbirds, again, based on position statements that we've developed from IAZA and indeed making sure that our voice of the zoo community is heard by attending both the standing committee and animals committee meetings as well. 
And when we're talking about representation on this global scale, there was a lot of uh, discussion and debate about the IUCN World Conservation Congress that was meant to take place in 2020, was postponed, postponed, and then finally, we were there over 5,000 people in person in Marseille a little over a week ago. Hopefully you followed our Instagram stories and kept up to date with what was going on throughout the conference, but it was definitely um, a wonderful opportunity to see people face to face, but also really see about where conservation is going um, from an IUCN perspective, but also within all of these global changes and challenges. We were delighted that um, two of our French members had stands at the conference, AFDPZ and Beauval as well. Again, uh, not only was the conference attracting a range of conservation practitioners, but it also had a very strong push on engaging the general public, visitors, schools, children as well. So these were great opportunities to engage in our zoo work with a range of different stakeholders and community types. IASA and many of our members also supported the uh, Reverse the Red Pavilion. This was a space within the Congress, supported also by the IUCN Species Survival Commission, SSC, that gave a range of presentations, discussions, panel sessions by lots of different leaders within our community, again, uh, demonstrating our expertise and engaging in a diverse range of conversations with people about the value that we can bring to the conservation community and the work that we're doing to save species as progressive zoos and aquariums. You can find out more about the Reverse the Red on their website as well and the work that we're doing with them. And finally, the last piece that was important in terms of the ICN Congress was the election process. So they elected a new president, uh, Razan al-Mubarak from the UAE. So great to have a president coming from within our IASA region and uh, she's definitely a good advocate for zoos and aquariums and we look forward to seeing her lead IUCN uh, as part of her new role. And of course, within the Congress was a large part about setting the motions process, which is the work plan for IECN and their members. So we were definitely involved in, um, in voting on those important motions, but also checking that the activities that IECN was looking to engage with um, were aligned with what we were looking to do from an EASA strategic perspective. Again, making sure that we're working in partnership going forwards together with other conservation actors. And when I talk about partnerships, um, I probably couldn't fit all of the different logos on the screen here, but we continued our great partnerships with WAZA and the AATA work, um, with AAP, with the AZA Reproductive Management Centre, PKBSI, our IECN specialist groups, and indeed our long-term collaborative partners, EAZWV, UAC, and um, EAAM, in terms of making sure we're reviewing the uh, memorandums of understanding we have, and making sure, again, our work is co collaborative and aligning together really making sure, if you haven't heard it enough, that we are achieving our vision of being progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you. And that then very much brings us on to facilitating, guiding and promoting our values and scientific work. Uh, this is where we're looking to take all of that expertise and really um, build upon it and communicate about it. And some of that is done through our document updates. So earlier this year, we had some key updates to our membership and accreditation manual really making it clear and transparent about what the processes are for corporate members, candidates for membership, and the work of the Technical Assistance Committee. And you'll have heard me mention quite a lot throughout the presentation already, how well we're working with EASA and our national associations. And so we wanted to outline some of those elements within this new manual or the manual update. Another position statement that was published um, a few months ago was our position statement on reintroduction of elephants from zoos really outlining the position of the TAG and IASA about where and when we think this might be appropriate within the general IASA framework for conservation translocations, including reintroduction. So these are freely available from the IASA website to find our position on that. Also, when we're looking at communications, we had um, a great overview of COVID, COVID impacts that was shared um, at Director's Days earlier this year and through eNews um, as a, um, a short video, really indicating the impact that COVID had on our different members um, throughout the region. And indeed, one of the things we looked to do as well was to think about how badly um, COVID had impacted our numbers in members in terms of visitor numbers. And so uh, when we're looking to calculate the membership fee for IASA, we have our different visitor number categories. And so here you can see the difference between the 2019 to the 2020 paying visitors, where we really see that shift um, of 
uh, members dropping um, a visitor number category. Over 42% of members dropped a visitor number category. And so what we saw across all of our members was an average 35% drop in visitors. Um, but that range was between 1% to 93. So it was really variable depending on which country you're in, which part of the country you're in. But the bit I take from this is that, yes, we had to close because of COVID and our visitor numbers dropped, but we were still able to carry out vital conservation work. But also when we were able to open again, those visitors came back and sometimes came back in higher numbers uh, or more regularity than before, really indicating the value they place on zoos and aquariums as an opportunity to connect with nature, as an opportunity to learn about nature. So I think we should be uh, uh, um, heartened by the fact that when we're able to open again, our visitors did return and we hope to see that continue as we progress through 2020 into 2022 and beyond. I'm talking about thinking of uh, impacts in 2020, but actually taking more of a positive spin on it. I would absolutely encourage you to have a look at the annual report and the tag reports for 2020 if you haven't done so already. Definitely, if I'm feeling bad about how, how you know, awful and, and how maybe we didn't get as much done as you wanted to in, in the last 12 months, I just need to look at these reports to feel uh, gladdened because the amount of work that went on, given all the difficulties, I think has been truly amazing. And everybody should be extremely proud of themselves for the work that we've all done together as an IASA community. And definitely these documents are testament to that. We continue sharing stories in our Zooquaria magazines and um, again, both available in hard copy and online, really demonstrating the work that we do. We're always looking for new stories and articles, so if you have one of interest, then please do reach out to us. And we also continue to publish your research in JZAR again, openly available. Um, we have a really high submission rate and we are continuing to increase the number of articles per issue that's doubled over the past sort of five or six years. So definitely uh, packed full of the zoo research that's carried out and so vital to making sure that we're able to make the right decisions for the animals in our care. If you want to keep up to date with what's going on within IASA, you can see on our main website the latest news page. We're also active on our social media in terms of Facebook and LinkedIn, and you can find uh, uh, exciting insights like this discover our members on different elements of our IASA community. For our members as well, we have our monthly e-news, which gives you all the latest updates, when those RCPs are published, uh, what new EP programmes have been approved, what new document updates have happened. So if you, you're not signed up to the monthly e-news yet, then please do make that request. And right towards the start, I did mention uh, that this time last year, we launched our Instagram profile, looking to expand our social media into a slightly younger demographic as well. And we have a focus within Instagram on sort of three main areas, amazing nature around us, our proud zoo people, uh, and indeed the work that we're doing to save species together with you. I should mention that when we say proud zoo people, we are including aquariums as well. That's particularly why I've got this uh, picture of these two gents at Den Bleu Planet in Denmark, because we just couldn't make that hashtag zoo aquarium people. So we are not discluding aquariums. We definitely would welcome uh, proud zoo and aquarium people from any aspects of our community to be part of these hashtags and sharing of our stories. So this time last year we launched Instagram, we had that one post, we had 18 followers and we set a challenge. We said, well, we'd like, we'd like, to, we'd like to make a thousand. Could, could we make a thousand followers by this time next year? And what do you think? Do you think we've managed to, to reach that? Well, I'm delighted that we smashed it. We're just under 4,000 followers. And so, of course, I'm going to set a new challenge. I would definitely like us to reach 10,000 this time next year. I would love to us to be up to 10,000 followers. So if you're uh, on Instagram but you're not following us yet, then please do press that, um, press that follow button. Uh, promote it to your friends. Join Instagram. This is a great opportunity to uh, find out about the work that we're doing via this social media platform and stay up to date with the work that we're involved in. We do also have a range of presentations and videos available. We have this IASA, what's that one, which is generally uh, focused about how the organization is structured, how decisions are made. Really handy to use with uh, board members or new members of staff that want to know about how IASA works. And thanks to the diversity of staff within the executive office and their language abilities, we translated that earlier this year into a whole range of different languages. So you can find this from the IASA member area. 
And we also have a full range of videos about the different work that EASA does. These are available from the main website and on the EASA YouTube channel as well. Again, if you're looking to showcase the work that we're involved in as an EASA community, uh, either to uh, board members or stakeholders or within your zoo, and there are opportunities to translate these as well. So we have all these great different communication tools. And one of the things we also wanted to do as part of this new focal area within the strategy was really make sure that we have a strong communicators network to expand the messages and be really coordinated and consistent in the messages that we're doing. So we're linking up this staff from as many members as possible, aiming to have quarterly meetings to discuss best practice, areas that we can really work on to maximize our messages. And we're looking for both marketing and non-marketing people. And if you're interested in joining and haven't um, been uh, invited to join yet, then please do reach out to David at the executive office to join. We'd love to have your expertise and input as part of this network. And then that brings us to our fifth focal area. But I knew I was going to run out of time. I looked at the number of slides. And also, we have a sustainability session specifically about this focal area in the uh, next session after this opening plenary. So I'm not going to talk any more about this fifth focal area now. I'm going to encourage you to join me after the break, and we'll talk more about managing operations to reduce our environmental footprint. Just a few last slides now to talk about conferences. Um, we had a range of online conferences this year. The Nutrition Conference, super successful earlier this year. We potentially broke the Zoom platform with the number of registrations that we had. Our Director's Days in Prague, also online, here now. And our education conference has been combined with the International Zoo Educators Conference uh, to have an international conservation education conference online in a little over a week and a half, two weeks now. So if you've not signed up for that, then definitely look to join us. But fingers crossed, all being well, our postponed Animal Welfare Forum and Conservation Forum from 2020 will be going ahead in person in 2022. So we just took a little two year break on those two conferences, but we're delighted to be able to return to the same hosts and look to have in person conferences on animal welfare and conservation taking place next year. So definitely keep an eye on the e news and our website for more information about registration programs, etc. And so basically, this is me this year celebrating on my own at home all our amazing achievements. Uh, as always, I could not be prouder to be part of this community, to represent all the amazing work you've done. As I said, I know I've gone over time. I could not shorten my presentation anymore. You've all been amazing. I just, congratulations for all the work that you've done together. I think we should be amazingly proud of it. But we talk about that chance and this opportunity to change. And definitely the changes have been challenging, but I'm gonna take this chance of saying, I'm gonna move from me celebrating on my own this year to be more like this. I very much look forward to the chance to meet all of you in person next year when we're in Portugal and uh, really celebrating our successes once again after another successful year. Um, so thank you for all of your great work and I very much look forward to seeing you all in person again in future. And then hopefully I'll stop the screen sharing and that will be um, the end of this introductory session. I just need to double check if there's anything of urgence that is coming up in the chat that I need to check in terms of housekeeping, but I'm not seeing anything. So thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, waiting this slightly uh, going over our time, but we very much look forward to interacting with you online throughout the rest of this conference and indeed celebrating our successes and the great work that we're all doing as progressive zoos and aquariums, saving species together with you. Thank you. <laughs>